You know, one of the things that we can learn from history is the impact that choices have over a long period of time. And we don't always see them immediately. It does take that, that time to really see what the ramifications are. It's said that a smart man learns from his mistakes, but a wise man learns from somebody else's. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look at some examples. We're going to try to be wise. Look from examples in history from uh, decades ago in a land far across the sea, China. China's history in the 20th century is full of changes. And most of them were initiated by one man, Mao Zedong. As a founding member of the Chinese Communist Party from 1949 until his death in 1976, Chairman Mao was responsible for uh, many revolutions throughout the 20th century. And we're going to talk about just a, just a few of them. That's all we really have time for in this video. After the initial communist takeover, there were many small revolutions that took place in different parts of the country or in different areas. And a lot of these were smaller in comparison to the ones that we're going to talk about today. There was something called the Sufan Movement in the mid-50s, which intended to end counter-revolutionaries uh, kind of before they started. The targeting was against intellectuals, thinkers, uh, other dissidents against the Communist Party. This paved the way for the Great Leap Forward. This involved governmental sort of micromanagement of industry, uh, agriculture, things like that. And they redistributed the land to uh, people who actually hadn't been farmers before, and they brought people in from the cities who you know, had been sort of corporate types, and they made them work in industry because they just really needed people to smelt iron and things like that. And they really tried to push the uh, country in a really specific direction. They tried to increase food production. They tried to increase the amount of iron that was being produced. And through this process, agriculture and industry were pretty much destroyed because policy was taking precedent over actual management of resources. The result of this great leap forward was the death of about 30 million people. At least that's the estimate. Years later, there was another revolution that took place that tried to revitalize this revolutionary spirit in the party. Uh, this took place in the 60s. It was called the Cultural Revolution. Mao's Little Red Book, which I happen to have a copy of right here, it stated in Mao's Little Red Book that they should oppose anything that their enemy supports and they should support anything that their enemy opposes. And this included literally everything. In order for the party to have greater control, what they ended up doing in this cultural revolution was pretty much destroying their history. They destroyed shrines, temples, museums, libraries, anything that they thought might have something that would oppose the party. The language that they used was even altered, and they would use slogans and they would use different phrases in order to unify people and change how people thought, not just about society, but even those particular words started to change. One prime example is the lower classes seeing anyone who had resources, wealth, land, anything as being the oppressors. For instance, students who were loyal to the party were sort of grouped together into things called the, uh, the Red Guard. And they would gather in groups and they would go and do things that would prime the pump for revolution again. One of the things they would do, they would go to apartments and they would actually go to these buildings and take out the landlords and they would beat them mercilessly, pretty much to the point of death. And then they would string them up with wires and hang different signs around them about things that they had done. But basically this was seen as struggling against the oppressors or struggling against those who would oppose those who were enemies of communism. They're struggling. That's what they called it. They would struggle against them. So the struggling became a phrase that they would use to basically make it sound like they were the victims, but instead they were the ones who were beating these poor people mercilessly. Could there have been some oppressors that were taken care of? Yeah, maybe, but this definitely is not the way to do it. Today, it's almost as if a lot of our media outlets, politicians, are taking a page out of Mao's Little Red Book. Anything that their political opponents supports, they cry out against. It doesn't matter what it is. If they find out that their political opponent hates something, they love it. <clears throat> the ability to have logical and peaceful conversations between people who don't see eye to eye is slowly disappearing. And this tactic of opposition to anything that your enemy opposes just leads to destruction. It's a terrible thing. Now, in the Bible, there is a phrase that encapsulates this idea really well. And it's found in the book of Isaiah. The passage we're going to look at, the prophet Isaiah 
is relaying judgments that he is supposed to tell them about. Basically, the people are rebelling against their God and the covenant that they made with that God, with Yahweh. And the judgments are not good at all. And spoiler alert, the people don't listen. And these judgments actually do come about. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. I'm going to read them right here. Beware those who call evil good and good evil, who turn darkness into light and light into darkness, who turn bitter into sweet and sweet into bitter. Beware those who think they are wise, those who think they possess understanding. This phrase, this idea of evil being called good and good being called evil, this is this sort of recategorization of morality and the public conscience to a point where those who want to do good will look out and actually put in the good category things that we would say are evil. And then the opposite then is true. They look out and see anyone who is doing good things. And because their their thought pattern is backwards, they actually oppose people who are doing those good things. They actively combat good being done. Honestly, this is what was going on during the Chinese cultural revolution, which most definitely benefited those who were up at the top, those who were doing the redefining. If we are not careful in the West, some of these types of things are going to happen here. Words are being redefined and are being used in ways that they've never been used before. And those who oppose particular ideas are starting to be referred to as mortal enemies, using lots of different phrases. Violence, beginning with words and ideas, when it goes unchecked, becomes actual violence. Violence that is then justified in the hearts of those who commit it because their categories of good and evil are backwards. So how do we combat this? Well, we have to take care that the facts that we accept are not being delivered to us with emotional packaging. Any new idea that we receive needs to be examined on its own, on its own merit, unhitched from the tide of culture. And I'm saying this about all sides. It doesn't matter, and and we use words like left and right, doesn't matter. We need to make sure that any information that we get is correctly assessed. And if we fail to take some sort of action here, we may find that society has followed a morality that is little more than driftwood brought in by the tide of manipulated public opinion to benefit those who stand above them. Well, on that happy note, if you have any thoughts, any ideas, any comments, go ahead and put them down in the comment section below. And if you want to see more content like this, thumbs and subs if you wouldn't mind. And until next time, Pilgrim on, my friends. I'll see you out there.